Patrick and I a few days early here, so I've already talked to a number of people who are doing all sorts of very exciting work here in Ireland, and a few people from the UK I've also been talking to. And um, I feel really awestruck and, and excited by the projects and the experiments that are going on here. Uh, so thanks to Amy for inviting me to come and have a chance to network with all of you. Um, for too many years, I've just been American and jet came to various places in the world to give you all our first visit and, and jet back home again. And uh, I intend to stay here for the whole conference and listen to your proposals. It's been really great to put this talk together, actually, because <clears throat> I'm a very creative person in my other life. And I've never really thought about mediation and creativity together before. So tonight's thoughts are fresh and new, and you, you may afterwards in the reception want to refine my thinking. But as I was thinking about what, what is creativity, what are we talking about, I think we're talking about the ability to combine things together in a new way. Occasionally in mediation you might do that by reframing something in a new way. But I think all creativity takes from two or three sources and puts things together unexpectedly. And if you're doing the creating yourself, it has to please you. It's, it's an act of uh, putting yourself out in the world in a way. And I think what puts it to the level of artistry or puts it to the level of true creativity is when it doesn't just move you, it also moves or works for the people who encounter whatever it is you create. This is another theme that uh, how many of you use the facilitator's handbook I was giving here? Fabulous book. Uh, I, I use it a lot in my facilitation work. <clears throat> and he's now with a different publisher, but he still has a diamond on the cover that's the same artist that did my triangle because we, the two books came out together and we designed the covers together. He has a diamond of participation that I often use actually with clients and participants, uh, not just academics. And that is that at the point of creativity, you want to diverge. You want lots of different ideas. You want to pull from here and pull from there. <clears throat> and it, when people are in conflict, they are often pressed to converge early, to make a decision to stop fighting. To, uh, and when that happens, they don't actually usually find a resolution at last. But he says what you have to do then is allow and encourage divergence, and then you get what's called the growth zone. This is a fabulously named thing. I use this often when I'm working with group clients to say, you know, there's going to be a growth zone. It's uncomfortable, it's ugly, it's not, it's not fun, but you have to go through it to get a real convergence on the other side. And I, I find that using that name gives them some distance from it, and they can smile and laugh about it in a little bit. So I think there's a process. It's not just creativity as a product. It's also a way of moving through by expanding and making decisions uh, and converging in your past. So creativity, I think, starts with a problem, a puzzle, something you're immersed in, that you're obsessed by, you're trying to think how you can deal with it or make it happen or resolve it. So creativity is partly about being really attentive to something. It's partly about knowing your craft. People who are very skilled craft people, I think, often are more effective creators. It's partly about intuition. It's partly playful. And most important, it's in the now. There's something about that flow state, the creativity flow state that's Second in the, in the when you get the balance right between all of those things, I think creativity bubbles. So in the 1970s, in my corner of the planet in Philadelphia, my mentor, Eileen Steve, who I love, they also a lot like this cartoon, um, she and her friends were doing a playground program that was helping teenagers in trouble. We had a juvenile delinquent school that was had a lot of suicides and other kinds of dangerous things happening. We had local police that were sitting German Shepherd police dogs on teenagers after curfew. And we had a lot of runaway runaways who were um, in trouble with their families. This brought Eileen and 
with several of the people she was working with in our local district justice courts quite frequently. And as they were sitting in the back looking at these cases that were coming through for either families and teens or for neighbors, they realized that it wasn't working very well for those types of disputes. And that the judges themselves were very frustrated by these disputes where they didn't know who was lying, they didn't know how to fix it, they couldn't really make an accurate judgment. Uh, and so, at this point, there were probably not even 10 mediation programs in the United States at the community level. It was just beginning. Uh, but we did have one in our, our municipal court in Philadelphia, a small landlord tenant concern. So I mean, and several others decided that they would experiment with the mediation program and see what happened. They went off to the American Arbitration Association to get negotiation training because there was no mediation training available in those days, probably. For those of you who know Chris Moore and Chris Moore's book, he and I we took the training together. So they came back from this training and uh, off they went. They didn't really know what they were doing. So it, it was more a matter of survival skills at the beginning. Um, and, uh, sorry. But the nice thing about this thing is that I came in maybe a year afterwards. Is that it's very high energy. You're doing something new, it seems to be working, you're trying to figure it out. And so there's a great deal of excitement in that year uh, among people who are doing mediation. A lot of solidarity, leaning on each other for ideas and support. I think creativity at this point is often like theater improv, improvisation that um, some people do in theater when it's not a set play. So, have you ever done theater improv? Ooh. I don't think I have at least one or two. Um, I haven't done very much either, and I think from my reading and workshopping on it that there's a lot. Uh, anyway, in a way, a mediator is improvising. They're, they're coming in and trying to figure out what to do with the pieces in front of them. When you're new at something, you're experimenting, it can be kind of wild. Um, you may put strange things together, it doesn't always work. And so I think one of the problems with creativity is that it necessarily means making a lot of mistakes. Um, so you're Jokes fall flat, the notes sound flat, the dance sounds flat, whatever it is you're trying to do this on the floor. In terms of mediation, I know that um, one of the first things they learned was having meetings held between parents and their runaway teens did not work when it was held at the parents' house. Okay, so they revised that, they went out to find some public spaces. Letting people vent too much or too long could make everything go out of hand. And yet, pressing them to really get down to agreement didn't seem to work either. Eventually, they put some boundaries on name calling. They extend the time that they encourage mediators to not talk about solutions before they turn to agreement. Maybe. And they discovered things like when people left with a piece of paper in their hand in agreement, that they would later report more satisfaction with the mediation, even if paper said virtually nothing or was broken, the agreement was broken within a week. There was something about taking something new to you that meant that you had to spend the hour doing something for that. So bit by bit, they started piecing together the things that worked, the things that didn't work so well. The reason I said it's like improv is because what they're doing is, and what you're doing is kind of hard to see here, sorry. But whenever you come into a mediation, still today, even though we have a, a lot of um, things that we've decided and we know how to do, we're still doing improv. Every group of people that you come with, come into contact with, is going to be different and need a little bit of a different approach. One of the basic, I think it's the number one rule in improv, is steadiness. So if somebody proposes something, you don't say you no, know, you say yes, and then you try to add value to it. Where does that connect with media? So, if a party tells you their toaster is talking to them in the morning, 
We don't say your toaster is mine. We don't challenge their perception of reality necessarily. What do you say? What's your toaster saying to you? Don't worry about it. That's, that's what you want to ask. Now, maybe down the road, you need to write the toaster's concerns into the mediation agreement, but you meet people where they are and, and you move from there. Another uh, story early on, not two actually, I, I did a lot of improvising in my very first mediation. I was still an intern. We got a call from the court, the district court, saying, oh, we have seven boys and their parents. And the woman they've been harassing in the courtroom. And we'd like you to come down and meet you because we can't do anything with this other. We're never going to get them back in the same room again. So, oh, all we went through this. We had never mediated 20 people before. We had no process. We didn't you know, have to interrupt the time of work with that many people. But, you know, we, uh, we helped. We figured something out. It took a while, but it was a successful mediation. So, uh, I think in those days, things were loose. And, and, uh, it was fun to try to figure out what to do. As you practice, as you rehearse, I'll tell you the other story. Um, another example of improv. We had a young mother who had had a baby with a developmentally delayed young man next door. And the baby was about two, but for the last year and a half, the family of the mother had not allowed the family of the father to see the child, even though they lived next door to each other. Uh, a lot of very deeply hurt feelings. So we had nine people that day. We had the mother, who was very young, very quiet. And then we had the other eight. Oh, the young man didn't come. And we had the other eight, and they were all incapable of trying. They all talked over each other all the time. Fortunately, I had a co theater who had been in the theater for many years. He just thought this would be worse than entertaining. He'd break the whole mediation. And what we did is, I would stand up every once in a while and say, Maria wants to say something. You all know that she's quiet, so, so let's just hold it for a second and let her say something. The other mother would say something. Off they would go again. So, we did that for two hours, and we broke every rule in mediation except the rule for making the ladies on space. And you know, they came to a really warm agreement and um, decided to end their feud and to co grandparent uh, across the households. As you uh, practice and as you get more experience, you get feedback from each mediation you do in terms of what worked, what didn't. Um, and gradually, as in any kind of improv, if a comedian is doing improv or sketches, eventually they settle on something that works, and then they will do that comic kind of sketch over and over again when they have the gig. Likewise, if a, a jazz musician is playing in riffs and experimenting, eventually that might solidify into a real jazz composition that gets uh, settled. And the same thing is, of course, happening to mediation. All that mess becomes this nice and little process. Um, and I'm sure most of you do something similar in your work, even if you call use it slightly different names. Um, and so from all that experiment, it comes a simple map that helps you cope. It becomes a teaching tool, um, as well as a <coughs> tool for mediation. At the same time, the more that you practice, the more complex your understanding gets. And so this is actually, those of you who endured this in my workshop today, sorry, this is actually a picture of what we think is actually happening during the exchange. I'm not going to walk you through it. Uh, you'll be grateful to know. But the point is that you have a much richer 3D notion so that when you go back to the outline, it's the wisdom that you have through experience is embedded in the simple thing that you see on the page. So most of you probably think that certification and legal framework and formal training and getting your master's degree from Naboo uh, are all part of bringing quality mediation to the public. I assume. Mediation was a movement in the 80s. It was full of idealism and experiment. We were the latest hot thing. 
these have been really important, vital to secure a mediation in place in our society um, and to give people good quality services. However, these efforts to control and standardize necessarily lay in preeminence, which brings me to the main theme of this talk, and that is that there is a necessary tension between creativity that's invented and the formalization that follows it which makes it possible to spread those ideas and methods more widely and record them and remember them. Neither can survive without the other. In fact, I've come, so I like to read this from here again. The left is sort of creativity's experiment versus standard procedures, inventing versus improving, frequent failure versus reliability, a one-on-one experience versus normalized or adopted and absorbed uh, structures, learning versus practice. So we need both. We go back and forth between them. And I actually think um, in some ways we're just nostalgic about creativity. Because it's fun to be in that world. Um, but I don't think mediation is there anymore. I, I think, and we'll get into this later, but I think mediation is, uh, the creativity has moved off to cousin things that are uh, practices that are cousins to mediation, perhaps. Um, and next year, probably the May of when you have this conference, it's going to be about quality and neutral. So, I was trying to think of creative solutions that my parties have come up with at the table. I have a long list of mediations I've done that I kind of remind myself of going out of And I went down the list. I had all those no mediations that had created a great good agreements, maybe, but very few that were created. So I said this last night at dinner, and the uh, other actually said, I had one. She had one where uh, the landlord, the landlady in this case, um, was owed back rent and accepted some barter or services instead of rent because the man didn't have the money. And so that's an example of a creative thing. Jamie Gunn also said, well, I sang in mediation once. One of the parties said, that reminds me of a song. And she said, yes, yeah. so and we both started to sing at the table. So there, there are moments, so I guess, but I think for the most part, um, there's some reasons why I wanted that creative mediation during a session special. One is that I think being creative takes a lot of time and some playfulness, and I think for many of our participants, emotion, uh, it's too emotional, it's too emotionally draining, it's sometimes, frankly, too financially draining to spend a lot of time crafting a perfect solution. If you want to finish a session in two hours, you're much more likely to accept a standard way, uh, a standard or customary outcome. I believe also that most people in conflict just want things set. They don't really care if it's creative, they don't care if it's an excellent agreement, and it fits them well, they just want to get out of there. And so they're willing to compromise, to do various things, to just be done with an emotionally uh, difficult experience. Of course, it's not true everybody, but I think it's phenomenal. Creative solutions are also harder to sell to a court. Judges less likely to approve them. They're harder to put into a durable contract because you have to think through the aspects of the contract if it's not a standard one. It's risky as to whether it will work or not. We've had divorcing couples, business partners fighting, barking dogs for millennia. Human beings have a pretty good idea of what works to resolve that and what doesn't. So I, I think in some ways there's not a lot of experiment to be had. It hasn't been experimented before. I conclude that creativity is a lucky byproduct. Sometimes it happens. It's not really the point or the goal of the mediation. The goal of the mediation actually is to get real. Um, I think mediation is really about what is real, what do we do with Whatever, I don't know how we did this Those of you who've been around in the mediation business for a while probably know two things happen at the time. One is that the place of doing things become intrusive.
little. They don't quite fit the current reality, or at least they become kind of boring. When the habits and rules hit the second and third generation, not the people who founded the mediation movement, but the people who come afterwards, they can become a form without embedded wisdom in it anymore. It's just the form they can do. We know that people understand this better when they experience it directly and create it for themselves. But the second reason is that over time, fresh ideas and practices inevitably succumb to the magnetic pull of powerful systems, schools, which are very authoritarian. It's difficult to put a peer mediation in there. It isn't moved that way. Regents, procedures of HR, um, our courts, industry norms, all of these pull mediation away from its sort of original fresh notions. So I put this up here because whenever people got a little too rigid about how mediation is and should be, I think would just pop up and say, uh, we made it up. We made it up. So yes, we've decided on some things, we've had some things that work, but keep this in the back of my mind. Well, maybe we can break this rule. We should just say So I walk into that too. The movement of the 80s created a field of practitioners and a field of academic study. The problem with ideals and creativity is that as time goes on, you need cash flow. I teach it more Once the excitement died down, the grants dried up, clients were not flocking to our mediation doors, mediators realized that community disputes were not going to sustain business, and they headed for disputes that could pay for institutions that could provide a steady supply of mediable disputes. So it's goodbye to our condolence, hello to divorcing couples, hello to suits. We went from landlord tenants to doing insurance settlements. Mediation firms hired retired judges to attract high-value commercial clients. And people like myself became trainers and went all over the U.S. and internationally to spread our ideas and our reputations. By the 1990s, um, mediation really is a business. It's also an academic discipline you can get to use in. And to stay in business, I think our mediation process also began to change. Our mediator, Susie Smith, now takes more control of the sessions that she runs. She needs to please her clients. She needs to achieve more predictable outcomes. Joe Jones shifts to caucusing and showing diplomacy more often because it avoids unexpected, unpredictable confrontations or explosions as people argue that we're on the table. Mediators with content expertise make recommendations and evaluations and constrain the topics that can come to the table. They may press the parties to compromise the set. And because the clients themselves expect the mediator to take an active role, they don't seem to notice or care that the mediator's core premise that we started with People can talk things out and solve their own problems. That core insight that we started with has been, I think, quite watered down. Ironically, it also gets us back to the original problem that Eileen's program was trying to solve. How do we respectfully and efficiently, effectively rather, resolve the disputes of poor members of society? Because those frames those folks don't bring money into the pipeline. So mediation is moving into the wealthier territories. And again, we're seeing that maybe less so on It sounds like we've got a lot of community mediation types that we're going to spend this. In the US, it's definitely very, very, very small programs, but they're very really small potatoes, I would say. So what happened to creativity? Well, let's put this up here to you. So this is just sort of my, my notion of how we moved from a problem to solve to a movement, a field, a discipline, a business. And I think now 
when it comes to no getting, and it's too long there where it's supposed to be the cure all for everything. It's just a good technique. It's a good set of techniques. Um, and there are a lot of other things you can do in conflict with the social media intervention as well. I think it's terrific that people are appropriating pieces of mediation for their own experiments and taking our values and our techniques into other contexts. Creativity takes things apart, you put them back together, you read the lines. Maybe it was the movie I saw on the plane, but the last few days I've begun to think that creativity is a lot like falling in love. You're in that creative flow. You can't make it happen. You can't control it. You can't keep hold of it. You don't quite know where it's going. And it doesn't last. However, there's some things I think we can do to keep ourselves open to it. One of those is to help create leader participants. I've heard a lot of people refer to John Paul Lederach this uh, last couple of days, and I think he has been really instrumental in focusing us on building a process from the participants outward instead of bringing our process and putting it on the table for people. How do they see the world? What kinds of processes are they used to using? Um, what suits them and fits them and feels comfortable to them? If you're doing that regularly, especially if you have a wide variety of people coming through your door, I think it builds your repertoire and your ability to create because you have a lot more uh, improv and experiment that has to happen and you're getting input from a whole different uh, cultural background. Thank you. 